Hello and welcome to part two of my home tour. In this more detailed version of my walkthrough video, I'll delve into some of the choices I made when designing and fitting out my compact home. I'll also discuss my thought process and throw out some related ideas on a few different topics. As you've already seen, I'll be referencing other videos I've shot and links for those are in the description below. So let's get started on the front porch. This is my front porch. It's about six by 10. I've got screen doors on both ends with roll up screens so I can control how much heat stays in and how much ventilation comes in. I got more info about that on my energy video. The long side has uh, plastic panels right now. They're about to come out as soon as pollen season is over. It's just a matter of taking out these screws and the battens and everything rolls up just as you can see in this uh, time-lapse video. Here's a link to my energy video which talks about the importance of an airlock in the winter time. It keeps cold air from rushing into the house when you go in and out the front door. I'm also working on getting roll-up shades which will help me control the heat gain in the summertime as the, the sun gets low in the west. This table is an important feature in any entry. I use mine for staging up groceries when I'm coming in for the house, especially on a rainy day. It's also handy when you're packing the car for a long trip. Of course, this one's gotten a little dingy over the years. I have a plan to replace it with a fold-down table that you can deploy with your foot. The idea is to keep your hands free for whatever you're carrying. The fan's ready for action on a warm day when you want to blow heat from the porch into the house. You probably noticed the patio tables nestled under the entry table. Well, I just pull them out along with a chair or two from inside when I want to eat out here on a warm sunny day. I have this coat rack out on the porch so I can hang up things that are wet and have them drip dry out here rather than taking all that moisture into the house. It's also handy overflow if I have guests. I have a clothesline out here that I use year round. I actually don't even have a dryer so this works out fine for me. I like keeping things inside here because in the winter time on a sunny day it gets plenty warm and things dry up real fast. The rest of the time of the year you don't have to worry about high winds or pollen getting on your stuff. I designed the entry door to open out. That saves a bunch of space inside. And with the big window and the door, it provides enough light and views on this side of the house, even though there are no windows. The downside to all this glass is that you can't have a conventional deadbolt that you can just turn because somebody could break the window and let themselves in and run amok. This one has a key, so it doesn't have that disadvantage. The exterior dimensions of the house are 18 by 16. And since it's a natural house, the walls are one foot thick, which leaves 14 by 16 on the inside. This room is about 14 by 11, and uh, that does kind of limit what you can do in terms of furniture layout. Um, if you look at this picture from back when I moved in, uh, I had a comfy chair facing the TV in the middle of the room, and the table was in the corner. If you go to dumbhome.com, you can download blank floor plans of the Windsor 500, and that will allow you to cut out paper versions of the furniture and play with your own furniture layouts. This IKEA table has worked out quite well. Not only does it have some storage, so you can keep things like napkins and games and so forth in the pockets, it has this leaf, which I'll put up on occasion when I have guests, and then I can seat four comfortably. This desk is a relic from my high school shop days, and it tucks in nicely under the alternating tread stairs. Incidentally, I have a dedicated video to the stairs, so you might want to watch that. The treads are actually pretty handy uh, for additional workspace if you need to overflow from the desk. And I also have this folding table that uh, gives me extra surface area when I'm in need of that. Normally, you'll see it folded up and tucked against the desk on the side there. It took a little searching to find a five foot wide love seat that would fit in this part of the room, but this has worked out nicely and it's plenty big for two people. Long term, I'd like to build my own furniture that has a, a customized ottoman and make it so that this right side armrest can come off, the ottoman can slide over on this side, and it can be a guest bed. I fasten the TV to that plank, and the plank swivels out from the cabinet so I can move it around and see it more easily from the love seat. 
for now I'm just using chairs to prop up my feet, but it's a pretty comfy spot to watch a movie. I didn't want to take up a ton of space with a real closet, so this coat rack does just fine. With room for six coats, it supplements what's out on the porch. When I was designing the house, I thought I might take some space in the bottom of the pantry, install a uh, closet pole and hang my coats there. I found I liked the storage space better. You'll notice the curtain actually takes up a whole lot less room than a door would. That would interfere with the, the coats and it would get in the way of this piece of furniture so I'd have no place to put my shoes. Note that's the printer table that goes with the desk that I talked about earlier. You'll probably notice a couple themes in this video, like how I enjoy taking the stud space and an interior wall and doing something with it, like storing CDs or providing knickknack shelves. I also like to use curtains as doors because they take up less space and it's super simple. You can save a bunch of money that way. Of course, some places like bathrooms demand privacy, so a solid conventional door is what you'd use there. I splurged on top-down shades as a way to control light and also heat gain. On hot August mornings, the sun will sneak in under the roof overhangs, heating up the floor and therefore the entire house. I can use the shades to block the heat while still letting light in. A better solution is an adjustable awning on the outside of the window to keep the sun's heat out entirely. That way you can control it seasonally based on when you want the heat in and when you don't. That's in the works, so look for a video detailing my solution in a few months. I love music, so I almost always have something playing. Well, except when I'm shooting a video. So I plan for my subwoofer and the little tweeters up on the shelves. I embedded the wiring in the wall itself behind the plaster, so it's super simple to hook them up. Let me turn on the ceiling fan. This is important in the summertime to keep the air moving. I find that even 80 degrees or 27 Celsius is comfortable in here with a little breeze on your skin. This Energy Star fixture is efficient and essentially silent at low speed. Medium speed moves as much air as I ever need. I've never even had it on high except to test it. This may just be me, but I like to measure the quality of a fan by how long it takes to come to a stop. The longer the better, and that means it's got good bearings. When I laid out my cabinetry, I ended up using a 30 inch wide above the fridge cabinet like, uh, like normal. But I didn't want that big of a fridge, so I got one that's about 24 inches wide and 5 feet tall. Built this little stand underneath so I can uh, store shoes and other stuff under there. And of course there's room on the side where I hang up a dustpan, broom, tennis racket, and a step stool. Believe it or not, I use the high spaces in my room so the step stool comes in handy. When I designed my kitchen, I never intended for a full-size stove. And uh, this two burner uh, induction unit has been just fine. It's, um, it's very energy efficient, which I like. It's kind of noisy, which I don't like. It beeps a lot. So there's what the fan sounds like. But all in all, I'm happy with it. If you watched my first walkthrough video, you might have noticed a red toaster oven on the counter. Well, that died, and I bought a bigger one because I wanted to be able to like cook bigger things like pizzas and stuff. That actually has to live in the pantry because it's too large for the, the counter space the whole time. If you wanted a bigger oven and didn't want to have to take it in and out, my suggestion would be to get rid of the desk here and put in a base cabinet maybe 24 inches wide. The oven can sit on that and you might even put in a shelf with the microwave above. So that's an option if you're more into cooking than I am. I've been quite happy with these wall mounted dish racks, another IKEA product. And it turns out I just keep a lot of the dishes that I use day to day in there, including silverware. That way I don't have to move them back and forth between a cabinet and the counter or whatever. If I uh, happen to be washing more than I can fit in the racks, I have this little microfiber towel that I put out and uh, I only need that a couple times a week. Another solution that's worked out really well is not having a base cabinet under my sink. So I've got this curtain and uh, you know there's trash on one side. There's recycling on the other. If I'm cooking, I can leave the curtain open and it's easy access to access both of those. And uh, there's more space because you don't have the um, toe kick picking everything up. There's a solid wood uh, plywood wall to screw into, which is handy for that water filter. 
And of course the first thing that happens with any kind of leak is um, the water damages your particle board cabinet and creates mold. So it's been a good solution and it's super simple and saves money. You might have spied this uh, spice rack that I built under the cabinets. It's pretty simple just a block of wood and uh, a T screwed and glued onto it. It's actually pretty useful because it uh, blocks the light from the under cabinet lighting from creating glare across the room. But it just plain finishes the look of the cabinets and uh, I didn't realize how important that was going to be until I finished it. While I'm in the kitchen I thought I'd just uh, mention how much I have enjoyed having these IKEA kitchen cabinets. Not only was the buying experience really good, um, they have somebody there to help you pick everything out make sure you don't miss anything. But um, they're real easy to assemble and it's quality product. It's not like junky particle board like just about all the cabinets you find. And I sprung for these uh, soft close hinges. That's pretty cool and uh, same for the drawers. Now I have to be careful going to other people's houses now because I tend to slam things. And uh, in case you haven't experienced it, um, having drawers in your base cabinets is a real boon. Compared to uh, doors with shelves, there's a lot more uh, storage volume available. And you don't have to spend time crawling around on your hands and knees to get at stuff anymore. If you're curious about my ceilings, those brown strips are the bottom flanges of the eye joists. And the white plywood is basically exterior grade that I painted white. And, uh, that's just laying on the bottom flange. I'll give you a picture of that in a moment, but it's just sitting there. If you like the look, it's kind of rustic. You know, it's an alternative to drywall, which I'll take any day. So if you pretend this pad is the plywood, it just sits on the bottom part of the beam. So let's take a look at the bathroom. You'll notice I use frosted glass on the bottom for privacy and clear glass on top. I like to be able to see out and see what birds are in the yard over there, or check the flag on my mailbox to see if the mailman's come. It's basically a, a little wet room. Um, the shower is about three foot square. I made my own shower rod out of a, a bent up piece of uh, copper tubing. And uh, you know, it's pretty simple. You drag the, the curtain closed. Put a couple little magnets to make sure it stays closed and the water stays contained in the shower. And I really like my growy shower head and the controls uh, can adjust the volume and the temperature separately. Of course after you're done showering the floor is wet so I use the little squeegee to dry it off. And uh, I also use this little mat in case I want to walk on the wet floor to keep my feet dry. You could uh, do something fancier than that for sure, like a teak grate or a little plastic uh, webbing, something like that. But that works for me. So when I first moved in, I'd built a uh, hand washing sink in the back of the tank of the toilet. So when you flush, the incoming water goes through a little fountain and you can wash your hands real quick while the toilet um, bowl is refilling. I found I never really used it that much. It's just a lot easier to go out and do your thing at the kitchen. To meet code, you do need to have a, a way to wash your hands. And so that's why I did that to get my building certificate. You'll also notice I keep a little uh, space heater down there. When I'm showering, I like to be warm. Probably notice that I've gone for shelves instead of uh, cabinets or anything fancy. They are super cheap and uh, quick to build. That top line of darker green is uh, wood blocking. So I do plan to put in a cabinet up there one day. Once I do, I, I'm actually considering putting in a little curtain because you know that I like curtains. It's nice to cover up the clutter on the shelves, keep the dust off, that sort of thing. You also might have noticed that I like to uh, use my space in the stud cavities. So I built that little medicine cabinet. I have a little storage over the door where I keep toiletries. You might recognize that pine tongue and groove from the main room. Uh, that's the beauty of solid wood is it looks good on both sides of the uh, wall. I just mounted my uh, towel racks right on the door. And it's actually kind of cool because um, with the uh, lime plaster here and the humidity control provided by the clay plaster in the main room, this room dries really fast. Like it's almost never wet for more than an hour. So it keeps the mold and mildew down. And with the lime plaster being so antifungal, it uh, is not even a problem to um, 
clean it a couple times a year. Just a simple scrub keeps it nice and fresh looking like this. So it's a small space at six foot four by three foot four, but it's really got everything that I need in it. And it's not even cramped, like the shower is spacious. There's plenty of room to use the, the toilet. And uh, you know, if you need anything to do with a sink, you just go out to the kitchen. Moving into the closet, we've got all the clothes that I use from day to day, either hanging from the, the closet pole or down in the dresser. I thought about building a custom storage solution when I um, was planning the, the space, but you know, I just haven't gotten to it and I'm kind of doing fine with the, what I have. You can see the space over the door, like in the bathroom. This is the uh, electrical cabinet, obviously. You know, by code, you're supposed to have three feet of space in front of it. Everything that I have here, I can move out of the way, so I'm not too worried about it. This chest is a nice place to keep bulky items that don't fit in the closet. It's also a handy place to sit, especially if you have guests. So you can see this uh, compact size uh, washer. Uh, there are smaller ones, but this one uh, does a nice size load. I generally do two loads a week for just me. Um, you could, if you wanted a dryer, um, reconfigure all your uh, utilities instead of these tanks go tankless um, you can mount it on the the wall on the inside of this um, plywood which is the finished plywood on the outside actually um, and I don't mean the green plywood I mean the natural color um, you can uh, fasten directly to that and um, you know then all these tanks and pumps and so forth with the floor heat will just be limited to the left side of the closet and you have a stacked washer dryer unit on the right. This is another thing that I've uh, sort of postponed because it's not a high priority. Um, I thought I'd make a little plywood enclosure for that uh, just to hide all the mechanicals, but you know, I'm kind of used to it and it's just not high on the priority list. Okay, let's head upstairs. But first you might be interested in this alternating tread staircase. I did a whole video on that, so I'm not going to get into detail here. I've got a link, I don't know, up here or maybe down in the description below. And uh, I also wanted to note, sometimes I misspeak and I call this a loft. It's not a loft because technically that has to be open to below on at least one side. So the official term is a habitable attic. Let's head on up. I designed the house with an 8 to 12 roof pitch, which means for every 12 inches of horizontal, there's 8 inches of rise. It's a little cramped. I'm six foot tall and I can't quite stand up in the middle, but I do have uh, plenty of sitting headroom in the mattress. If it's dark, I end up kind of crawling around at night uh, to, to get down if I needed to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. But um, other than that, it's, it's been okay for me. So if you're looking at the plans on dumbhome.com, you won't find this house exactly, but the closest thing is the Windsor 500. I designed that one with a steeper roof pitch at 12-12, that gives you about seven feet of headroom in the middle. Plus there's a dormer over the stairs so you can stand up straight and walk out rather than being hunched over like this. You can see I just sleep on this eight inch foam mattress sitting right on the floor. I considered uh, when I was designing the place I might build a, a raised platform for it. Um, but with the roof pitch what it is, I don't want to give up the headroom and bump my head all the time. And I don't feel like I need the storage space. In a 12-12 pitch roof, like the Windsor 500, there's certainly more headroom and uh, you might be wanting to raise the, the bed up maybe 12 inches or 16 inches. That makes a handy place to store things that you don't use every day, like suitcases or Christmas stuff or whatever. I built shelves to provide storage on the sides of the attic for stuff like off-season clothes, books, rarely used kitchen stuff, paper products, things like that. I designed mine around cardboard banker boxes, which are cheap and readily available. Instead, you could pick out a supply of plastic bins, get a bunch, and change the dimensions to suit the bins. This contraption is my magazine holder. It's part of my back therapy, so I can lay out flat on the bed and read after a long day hunched over the computer. It's really simple. It's just um, a piece of plexiglass that holds up the magazine. There are three holes punched in it, uh, two holes hold it against the wall. And the third is a little lanyard that holds it up on top. Super simple and effective. I've got this extra clothes storage up here in the attic. It's really just a closet pole tied off to some beefy eye hooks that are screwed into the roof rafters. Thankfully, I don't need ties very often anymore, and I almost never use my suits, but they're right here when I need them. 
This is my bill pay desk, which I don't actually use very much anymore because I do most of my banking online. It's just a repurposed drafting table sitting on top of filing cabinets, so super cheap. But it's uh, pretty handy to have all my supplies and stamps and everything right at hand, and I do use the filing cabinets pretty frequently. It's still April, so I use this window fan on the warmer nights to cool off the attic up here. In about a month, I'll put my air conditioner in the window, which does a really good job of keeping the entire house cool, and it's super quiet because it's a dual inverter model. I'll put in a link to my energy video where I get into more detail at around 12 minutes in. This vacuum is a relic from my days in a bigger house, and when it dies, I'm planning to buy one of the newer compact units, which can act as a handheld or has an attachment to clean the floors. It's small enough that it can hang up right in the closet downstairs and always be convenient. When I built the attic knee walls, I created a few secret compartments. There isn't a whole lot of room there because the rafters and insulation up take up a lot of the space, but it's a handy storage spot for things like family history that I know I can't get rid of, but which I don't really need on a daily basis. When I was designing the attic, I seriously considered building some floor hatches to allow me to store things between the floor joists and sitting on the ceiling panels for the first floor. I haven't gotten around to it, mostly because I don't need the space, but also because this rug would make it inconvenient. Still, it's a cool detail that I've seen in some tiny houses. Of course, I don't feel the need to fill every nook and cranny in my house because I ended up building a garage. I needed that kind of space for things like boats and kayaks in my wood shop, and it handles the overflow nicely. I'm a big fan of using unconditioned space like a shed or a garage, because why heat and cool every item that you own? In wrapping up, I'll talk a little more about my design intention with this house and how you might adapt the plan to suit your needs. At the same time, I'll preview the plans page of dumbhome.com. Please leave a comment and tell me if any of the plans I've worked up so far is particularly interesting to you, or if there's something you're looking for that I haven't presented yet. I'm always sketching, so the next plan you see on my website might incorporate your suggestions. You should know that I don't stage my house before I shoot. I want you to see a realistic picture of how I live in 420 square feet, but I'll usually take 5 to 10 minutes to tidy up a bit before I start filming. This house design was an exercise in living comfortably for a couple years within a minimal footprint with the idea that I would build a larger but still compact house after a couple years. At that point, I would use this building as a guest cottage, home office, or music studio. Well, a couple years has turned into almost five and this place still checks off nearly every box on my wish list. The time, expense, and hassle of building a larger home just isn't worth it at the moment, so I'm enjoying the many advantages that come with compact living. If you're interested in building a compact house like mine, consider the Windsor 500. With conventional 2x6 walls rather than the 12 inches in my natural home, you'd get about 8% more usable room downstairs, and the steeper roof pitch affords more headroom upstairs. Or just stretch the floor plan a couple feet like the Windsor 570 and get even more flexibility in furniture layout. If I'd known I'd be so content in this space, I probably would have built the 570 with its larger porch. If you're not sold on the alternating tread stairs in these smaller houses, I've designed the Windsor 485 with a first floor master bedroom. That first floor bedroom can be added onto any of the Windsor designs to create a two bedroom home if you're looking for a little more space either now or in the future. If you have other ideas you'd like to explore, I can customize any of my standard plans for a reasonable fee. Feel free to get in touch using the contact page of dumbhome.com. If you're still with me, thanks so much for watching to the end. Who would have guessed that I could spend so long talking about a diminutive 420 square foot house? Anyway, happy house daydreaming!